Welcome to the West Side Church in Rockford, Illinois. A legacy of praise, a beacon of hope, a vision of tomorrow. We hope that you enjoy this message. The blessing of the Lord be upon you. I bless you in the name of the Lord. Let's go to God in prayer. I've got an important word to share with you on today. And I believe God is trying to help us in the midst of this pandemic. Father, we appreciate you. We bless you. Thank you for your goodness and for your kindness. Thank you for the day that you have made and for this month we've had and the many months we've had this year. And though some would say this is a horrible year, this is a year, as someone said, of vision. We see the unseen that we didn't see before, and we thank you for it. Now, I ask you to anoint and bless the word I'm about to bring that you gave to me, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you to turn your attention to Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 46. Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 46. And I want to thank all of you who have been tuning in weekly over the last many, many weeks where we have been on YouTube, where we have been on Facebook, and where we have even been on our own website. And you've tuned in to hear the message for the week. And I'm hoping this message today will challenge you to go to a new level. So I want to set this, the stage of where we are in our text. Um, the, we have just completed the Lord's Supper. Judas Iscariot has been dispatched to complete his betrayal of the Lord Jesus, and the Lord and the 11 remaining apostles are on their way to the Mount of Olives. They've left the upper room. We're just before the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, somebody would say, why are we preaching this and it's not uh, in that season? This is not a seasonal message. This is a message where we look at the life of the Lord Jesus and find out how we can survive in the midst of our pain. So let me read the text and then I'll share with you my thought. Coming out, he, which is the Lord Jesus, went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. I'm reading out of the New King James Version, by the way. And his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and prayed saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer, and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. I'm going to read that again in a second and go through and talk about what's in the text. But I want to use for this thought on the day coming out of verse 44, which said, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And here's our thought this morning. Let your agony increase your intensity. Let your agony increase your intensity. Let's talk about this year of vision. 2020, that was kind of a cute theme. I found over time, though, it's exactly true. We have found and discovered, we have seen who people really are this year. We may have been deceived in 2019, but in 2020, our vision has become crystal clear and we see exactly where people are. And it has caused agony. Agony is extreme physical or mental suffering. Extreme agony, uh, agony is extreme physical or mental suffering. Uh, look at 2020, the year. The COVID-19 pandemic has killed nearly one million people across the world, and there are 32 million cases. 
This has caused great agony in our churches, in our communities, in businesses, in our personal lives. This has caused agony everywhere. That's not all, though. Go to the West Coast, not just California, all the way up to Oregon. There are fires everywhere, and the smoke is across the country. One fire was caused because a group got together for a gender reveal party violating social distancing laws, and somehow they caused a fire that has now displaced so many people and burned so much property and causing so much sickness because of the smoke. Then we have hurricanes and tropical storms in the south. Just this past week, I saw a picture of Houston underwater again. And now it's not a big news deal because we saw it last year and we saw it the year before. So now it seems like nobody cares, but our vision has clear now and we see who you are. Louisiana has been ravaged by a hurricane. Now there was one after that that was headed toward Louisiana and turned and went to Alabama. All of this in 2020. Then after the hurricane came through Louisiana, it spurred an outgrowth of mosquitoes that attacked cattle and they were losing cattle because mosquitoes, itty bitty things, were attacking the cattle by the thousands and killing cattle. Go across the sea to Africa and there's locusts ravaging the countryside. Then there's a new vicious insect that has shown up and they said it has reached our shores called the murder hornet. Now, if that's not good enough, unemployment levels are as high as they have been since the Great Depression. Not the Great Recession of the late uh, for the first part of this century, but the Great Depression almost 100 years ago. People are out of work. And just this past week, Around close to 900,000 new filings for unemployment, and they said we never reached those levels during the Great Recession, but we saw them in the Great Depression. Businesses, especially restaurants, are closing for good. We've seen it in this city, but they said in Chicago, a city that runs on restaurants, they expect 5,000 restaurants to permanently close their doors this year because of the pandemic. The pandemic has said that if our loved ones die, uh, we can't have a traditional funeral. Uh, we can't come into the church house and celebrate them. We can't help the family through with a repast and time of fellowship and gathering. But no, instead, even in our own church, we've recently had a loss. And I heard today they're going to have a moving service. This is a family that could easily fill our church just with the immediate family, and they can't get past 50 people because of the pandemic. Closure is difficult. Travel's a problem. Are hotels safe? Is that restaurant safe? Will my family be safe if I go in there? And many have contracted the disease in family settings. A friend of mine, a pastor here in this town, caught the disease at his wife's funeral and soon after he joined her in the heavenly body. He transitioned, he died from the virus. And after all of this, there is no end in sight. In fact, many experts say we could be in the same condition in September of 2021, one year from now. Then we have to add protest, social injustice. Oh, we see who you are now. We see the difference. We see how you really feel. And here's the reality. Some of you may say, well, I don't believe in Black Lives Matter, but the lives and the matter, the black lives of my sons my wife, my daughter-in-law, my grandson, and my brand new baby granddaughter, they all matter to me. And I don't even know myself if I'm safe in this city being pulled over by a police officer that I may have hired as the chairman of the Fire and Police Commission 
over the last six years. We are living in a time of great agony. But our text has the answer for what we should do to not only sustain ourselves, but to excel, excel, excel in this time. Let's go back to the text and pick out some things and see if we can understand what the Lord is doing here. So in Luke 22 and 39, again out of the New King James Version, uh, the Lord went to the Mount of Olives. He went to his favorite place of prayer, his place where he can go and not be distracted, where he can talk to the Father unhindered by the cares of life. When he came to that place, he told them two things. First, pray. And then they, they gave him what to pray for. Pray that you cannot enter into temptation. Now, here's the thing I love about that, and I'm concerned about with that. He didn't just pray that you don't fall to temptation, but don't even get into it. Because there's a possibility, and they're about to see the reality that they will not succeed. They're carnal-minded. They've missed a lot of things. They've argued with the Lord. The Lord prayed for Peter, and Peter rejected the Lord's word. He told them, I'm getting ready to go be offered and sacrificed, and they argued about who's going to be great. They needed to pray, but they were carnal. They, were, hey, they could not grasp spiritual things. And this is where we are. We must pray against temptation, the temptation to complain, the, the temptation to hate the temptation to rebel, and the temptation to get cold with God. And the Bible says he was withdrawn about a stone's throw. So think about, you know, wind your arm up real good. How far can you throw a rock? When you get through that rock, you can probably see where it landed, unless you're a major league baseball player. Even then, you might see where it landed, and you can see what your leader is doing. But they saw him kneel, and they didn't kneel. See, the victory of the cross was won in that garden while he was on his knees. The victory over our agony will be won on our knees. When we follow his lead, we will also avoid failure in these times, times that can kill us. Friend of mine, there's so many people we've heard week after week after week. Those that have not died have had permanent impairment in their bodies due to this disease. And then we have those that say there's no big deal. I went into a gas station in this city just the other day to get a cup of coffee, and I was the only person of about 10 to 15 people in there wearing a mask. And I was not going to take it off. It prompted me to make sure that when I was finished with the assignment I had for this week, I went back and got my third COVID-19 test because I said, I'm going to stay ahead of this thing. It's free. Why not? All it cost me was 15 minutes of my time. And, and, I, and that time is going to make me feel good about where I am. But Jesus was in agony. He said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup from me. Oh, you can tell the agony because he's praying against something that was established before the foundation of the earth, according to the book of Revelation. But then he had a change. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Some said that he was dealing with his human side and fear of death. I don't buy that. Now, I don't buy that one bit at all. The Lord knew who he was. He knew he was God. He came from God and would return to God. People fear death when they fear the unknown, but he knew what he was doing. Somebody said he was afraid of the pain. Jesus was a robust, strong man, a carpenter who, who fashioned his furniture by hand. No power tools, no special tools along the way. A man of great personal strength and a man of personal self-discipline. No, this cup represented sin, and sin is agony. 
But then the Bible says in verse 43, an angel appeared from heaven, strengthening him. Father, in all that we're going through, we need you to send your strength from heaven. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Luke, the great physician, said his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Why do I say Luke said that? Because it was a medical uh, 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 event that was happening in the Lord's life. He prayed with greater emphasis. He prayed with greater intensity. He prayed with greater passion. And some said he probably prayed crying and with tears because he knew the answer was found in prayer. You see, the answer to our agony is to pray more seriously, more sincerely, more focused, and with more intensity. Uh -huh. But when he rose from prayer, the disciples were asleep. See, everybody won't get this message because you're asleep. You have your mind, you're dreaming of a day gone by. Earlier this year, my wife and I were in Milwaukee at a conference and this Thousands of people there enjoying ourselves in the conference. And then a bit later, we had a membership appreciation dinner and all the members got together and we, we communed together and we laughed and enjoyed each other. And then a little bit later, we celebrated our assistant pastor and had standing room only in the church. But we can't do that now. And let me tell you, after this is over with, we are looking at how we will change things for good, but some will be angry because they're asleep. Wake up, we have to pray. Then he said, why do you sleep? And he warned them again, rise and pray, lest you fall into temptation. But they could not have imagined what they were about to go through. During this time, we at this church have prayed more than we've prayed before. We've seen more people join us in the prayer. We've seen miracle signs and wonders in the prayer. Let me share with you something, not in my notes, but what the Lord gave me this week. I was in my bed, I was asleep, and a dream came, and I saw the Spirit of the Lord moving across the land, and people were being healed, delivered, and set free just because God wanted to do it. I see a time when the, the people of God will, amen, begin to let their agony increase their intensity that God will begin to work like never before. The answer is not found in Pfizer. The answer is not found in Johnson & Johnson. The answer is found on our knees before God. Hallelujah. So when we pray more seriously, we pray more sincerely, we pray more focused and with more intensity, we'll find God in the midst of our prayers. I know you're praying. I am too. But we've got to turn this up. We have to show God that we trust him in the midst of our agony, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our suffering. We have to pray to keep from the temptation to complain, the temptation to fear, the temptation to hate, the temptation to sin. Don't forget who you are in the midst of this agony. 1 John 4 and 4 says, you are of God, little children. Don't forget, you are of God. I've had feelings come up recently of watching all of the things that happened. People with my same paint job, African-American people, shot down and brutalized. Those that were going back to support them shot down and brutalized. And I felt something rise up in me that I haven't felt since I was a young militant teenager. And I said, God, I've got to remember I am of God, and I have overcome them because he who is in me is greater than he that's in the world. 1 John 4 and 4. Go back and grab that and tell yourself that. Before you hate, remember, remind yourself, I'm of God. I don't hate. God is love. Uh huh. Now, while you're praying, let me give you what to pray for. Pray for the Lord to keep you from thoughts of doubt and fear. Somebody right now will say, well, he's getting all those tests 
because he's afraid. Now I'm getting all those tests because I'm being cautious of those around me that I love. If I caught the virus and the virus took me out of here, I've lived almost 50 years for Jesus, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm ready to stand before God. Are you? Are you? I'm not afraid, but I'm afraid for the folks that God has given me to lead. I'm afraid for them. I, everybody hasn't got the same intensity. I'm looking to increase my intensity. But Isaiah 41 and 10 says, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Yeah. What else are we praying for? Pray for the Lord to keep you from complaining. Oh, yes, if some have come to me and they said, well, when are we going back to the church? Oh, when are we going to be like it was? Oh, I, I hate to tell them, and I do tell them, and I, but I have to tell them it's not going to be like it was before. They said there's possibility of more pandemics behind this one. We have to be ready for the enemy's devices. But complaining only gets you in trouble. Read the book of Numbers sometime. Find out how all of the time when the people complained, all it did was make God angry. Put him in a rage. Uh-huh. But instead, we are told in Philippians 4 and 6, do not be anxious about anything. You know what anxious means? Wringing your hands. You're, you're, you're sweating. Your stomach is hurting. You can't digest your food. You can't sleep at night. All of this, that's not for you. Did, I remember, you, did you remember 1 John 4 and 4? You are of God. He said, do not be anxious about anything but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Philippians 4 and 6, out of the New International Version. Now, what's your next thing that we're praying for? We're going to pray for the Lord to keep us from worry and frustration. Matthew, 20, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29 in the New Living Translation says this. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. When you worry, that's a heavy burden. When you're frustrated, that's a heavy burden. He said, I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Thank you, Lord God. Then we're going to pray for peace and restful sleep. For Philippians 4 and 7, right after that verse we quoted earlier, says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Did you see what I said? We're going to pray against complaining. We're going to pray against worry and frustration. We're going to pray for peace and restful sleep. But the main thing that we're going to do is we're going to pray so we won't fall into temptation. And then, watch this, we're going to pray for our enemies. The year 2020, the year of crystal clear vision, has revealed many enemies. Many that we did not know were there. Some I found even in my own neighborhood and they come to come and greet us with no mask on as if it's a hoax. No, it's not a hoax. It wasn't a hoax for the man that was buried just last weekend who succumbed to the virus in another state, another city. No, it wasn't a hoax for his family. It wasn't a hoax for the thousand or so people that died yesterday. It wasn't a hoax for the 202,000 Americans uh, uh, as of this week, at the end of this week, that have died, and it's growing by a thousand every week. But we're going to pray for our enemies. Come on, preacher, you got to help me there. I will. Matthew 5, 44, New Living Translation. Jesus said, but I say unto you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why are you praying? Because you may want revenge, but will your revenge 
end up sending them to hell for eternity? Oh, no. We are going to allow our agony to increase our intensity. We are going to allow our agony to change our prayer life. We are going to allow our agony to increase our faith. We are going to allow our agony to love God more and love our neighbor more and love our enemies more. And we're going to stop saying the things that everybody else says. And we're going to pray for those who despitefully use us. That's it for this week. Let's let our agony increase our intensity. Now let's pray. And as I pray, I want you on wherever you are listening to this message. I want you to put your mind what you need God to do for you today. I want you to get it in your mind, focus it in your heart. Lord, I need you to bless here. Lord, I need a job. Lord, I need healing. Lord, my loved ones are wayward and they need to come to you. Lord, I need, I need, I need. He said, bring it to him. There's no reason you can. And then some of you may say, Lord, I want. That's all right. Bring it to him. He said, bring it to him. Now get your mind on that and let's pray. And I'm looking forward to hearing testimony of what God has done for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, my soul loves you. My, I love you with my whole heart, my whole soul, my whole mind, my strength. I love you, Lord. I bless your name, O oh God, for you are good, merciful, kind, and gracious. And there's none like you. And oh, God, right now, there are so many that are praying with me that have needs, that have desires, that have wants, oh, things that only you can do. Only you can do. Thank you, O oh God, for the testimonies of how you have made ways out of no way. I appreciate you. Thank you for my new granddaughter and cover her with your blood and keep her, oh God, in the midst of this, oh God. And our prayers are for all, not only for her, oh God, but for the babies that have come into our church this year, the babies that have come into this world this year, that you would cover them with your blood and keep these innocent hearts. In the name of Jesus, meet the needs of your people everywhere and let your people be encouraged. I cast out discouragement. I come against despair. Hallelujah. I come against the downtrodden spirit in the name of Jesus and tell you to be lifted up in Jesus name. And I say, even as our presiding bishop says, I see you in the future and you look much better than you do right now. May the Lord bless you real good is my prayer in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.